as humans, we're able to process death when we know, no matter how tragic it can be. When a family knows, they can process that and they can begin to move on. When a family doesn't know, it's brutal. I would much rather a kid be in the drunk tank in a jail overnight, safe with a public intoxication charge and be alive. That's one of the most suspicious things about Sebastian's case. When you have a young child out there, they're easily taken advantage of. And we have a lot of really nasty people out there. True crime enthusiasts, welcome to Break the Case. I'm your host, I'm Jen Coffendaffer, and I am here to cuss and discuss some cases with you. We have a great guest. You might remember him from his involvement in finding Kylie Rodney. Now, for those of you who weren't in the true crime community or perhaps just didn't follow the case, Kylie Rodney was a young teen girl who was at a huge, huge party. And she left that party in her vehicle never to be seen again. Law enforcement, volunteers, everyone was searching for Kyle Rodney's car and for Kyle Rodney. When they exhausted all search efforts and law enforcement threw up their hands and said, she is not in these nearby waterways, we're done searching them. They reached out to Doug Bishop and the crew and they came on scene and literally in no time, they locate Kylie Rodney's car and most sadly, did they locate Kylie Rodney, who was deceased, drowned in her vehicle, unable to escape. But we are fortunate to have Doug Bishop here, who was so involved in that and has been involved in multiple vehicle recoveries and investigations that have solved so many missing persons cases. And please, if you've listened to any of our programs and like what you see, please press the subscribe button. It's free to subscribe. But without further ado, and not to digress any longer, Doug Bishop. Doug, again, I am thrilled to have you here. Uh, thank you for joining us. We cannot wait to get into what you're doing now, all about your new ventures and the current projects you're working on. So take it away, catch us up with you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to have me on and talk about uh, all of this really important stuff. And uh, I'm really excited to get into it. For those of you who are watching this and that don't know, I am Doug Bishop, I'm with United Search Corps. I specialize in searching for lost loved ones, particularly those in cold cases and also advocating for families of the lost. That's great. Such a good summary. Before I had you on in the intro portion, I talked all about you, how we first came together through the Kylie Rodney and how we continue to talk about different cases. You know, I, I'll give you a call as an example with Christian Martinez. As you know, I just uh, reached out to you about the most recent case with Riley. Talk to us right now because I know you had a big project in Portland concerning the retrieval of about 10 vehicles. Is that right? Well, we actually located 15 vehicles in the city capital of Salem. This is one of just a, a few searches that I've done already on these particular cases here in the central Willamette Valley. And we were really blown away when we discovered uh, eight vehicles just in one pond alone. It is one of the biggest fishing spots in Oregon. So it was uh, really alarming to locals, the FBI and so forth. We put together a big mission the other day to uncover quite a few of those vehicles. We had a really big towing company, Northwestern, out of Portland, Oregon, come down to help us recover those vehicles. And uh, it was a really big dive operation from our team. Right now, the vehicles that we've dove on and recovered are uh, preliminarily on the, under investigation. Now that we have them out, we have the info, the license plate, the VIN numbers. They don't match the cases that we were working on, but we're doing the back end research to figure out you know, where these cars came from and also what they may or may not be connected to. And is it true, Doug, that a lot of these vehicles you find are tied to insurance fraud cases, tied to mafia 
even getting rid of vehicles, uh, getaway vehicles, and of course, sometimes missing people. What would you say that percentage is when you kind of break it all down? It's probably about 90% insurance stolen vehicles. To give a perspective of that is, you know, I've found thousands of vehicles in the United States underwater. And the majority of those vehicles are due to, you know, insurance fraud dumped, you know, whether or not they were used in carjackings, you know, attempted murders, drive-bys and so forth. Why a vehicle is dumped is for, you know, an array of reasons, whether that be one of the ones I just mentioned, insurance fraud, you know, stolen vehicles and so forth. But, you know, it is a huge process of elimination. It is a lot of very hard work. We're talking about work that nobody else really wants to do. We're diving in waters other divers don't want to be in. These are very dangerous locations. We're talking about water that is you can barely see in most of the time, currents that are really deadly. And to recover these vehicles is, is quite the task. It's not easy whatsoever. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Doug, because I think a lot of people believe that, as an example, the FBI's dive team or local dive teams, sheriff's dive teams, and it's not to disparage them, but they're called out on very specific missions. They full-time are investigators or working police work. So their time behind the tiller is what I call it, where they're actually doing this work day in and day out, hours upon hours is limited. And to me, that's where you all bring the expertise uh, that's needed to really do fine-tuned recoveries. So, Doug, what is the particular case right now that you're working on in terms of a missing person? So there's a few cases in the central Willamette Valley that we're focusing on when I'm in my home area, the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is this 16 year old Brian Joseph Page who vanished out of uh, Salem, Oregon. He was at a party, him and his vehicle, his 1962 Volkswagen Beetle vanished, never seen again. This was in the early seventies. It's tragic anytime we lose anybody. Everybody's case is just as important as the next, you know, but when, when it's a young juvenile that has so much life ahead of them, it, it's, it's even more tragic to go have somebody go missing like that, especially missing with no answers. In this particular case, there was nothing. He just vanished from a party without a trace in his friend's vehicle, just fell off the face of the map. And that's where, you know, the, my nonprofit United Search Corps can come in and we can pick up cases that are cold because we don't have to justify the use of resources. Law enforcement, as you know, local, state, and federal, they really have to justify their use of resources. And it makes sense. And not a lot of, a lot of people understand that. Why can I do this and the government can't? And, and that's, that's a horrible perspective to make, but a lot of people carry that particular perspective. But it's the justification of use of resources. The government is funded by a lot of different corporations and taxpayers and so forth. And that money really has to be utilized in the best case scenario. You know, you come from the FBI. So if there's no leads or anything to go on, you know, you, you got to put your resources to cases that there are leads. There is something to go on so that you can bring justice to a case. In Brian's case, none, nothing to go off of. And that's what led us to the Salem area where he's from, where he was went missing, I'm sorry. He's from Portland, where I'm at right now, which is about an hour north of the capital of Oregon, Salem. You know, when I was with the previous organization I was with, you know, we searched the Willamette River, we ruled that out, and now we're, we're moving out to other areas of water, rock pits and ponds and other places that you may not suspect vehicles. And so far, that switch in the investigation has led us to more vehicles than uh, we've ever uncovered in this search. Like many searches and investigations, no matter how you paint it, it's a huge process of elimination. Brian's case is definitely one that is going to take a lot of work and we're not going to give up and we're going to keep working it as much as we can. The other case that we're working is the case of Vicki Lynn Holler, who vanished from the central Willamette Valley as well, who was suspected of being a victim of Ted Bundy. In this particular case file that I've obtained, there is no direct tie to Bundy whatsoever, other than he was in the area at the time she went missing and she was kind of his type. Why that language is in the file, I don't know. What I can tell you is there's nothing but speculation connecting her case to Ted Bundy. If you look at his victims, you know, they're they're kind of young and but but they, you know, when his types kind of varied, hairstyles and so forth. There really wasn't a 
exact type. We know she's missing and she's missing with her Volkswagen Beetle as well. So we're looking for her vehicle and, and ruling out areas of possibility for where her vehicle is at as well. And uh, she's missing out of Eugene, which is just south of Salem. And that's the Willamette River that actually begins in Eugene and heads north. Doug, when we talk about this, I'm going to reel it into Riley Strain. Just imagine if it was decades, like the people you're looking for, what a harrowing and, and really difficult situation that would be for the parents. We have watched Riley Strain's mom just beside herself with anguish and sadness. These families that you're helping out have been going through this for decades. So it's wonderful that you're looking but turning to Riley Strain, all of us are just so glad that at least there is some closure and not that mystery. Yes, yes, absolutely. As you know, I was uh, our, our team was deploying to Nashville. I was in the Alaska Lounge as it was reported that his body was found there by the local team there to me directly. It was a it, it's a it's a catch twenty two. In these active cases, you always have to hold hope that. They're going to be found, found alive, no matter what the circumstances are. You you always want to hold out hope, and that's important when you're searching and when you're we're fighting for answers on any level of the aspect pertaining to the case, an onlooker and so forth. Like you have to hold out hope that this person is going to be found and found safe in some form or another. That wasn't the case. He was found deceased in the Cumberland River, which runs directly through city center of Nashville. It's a horrible outcome. It's tragic but it is a miracle that they found him. It really, really is. The Cajun Navy's response and the other organizations that were there, I know they're getting a lot of bad flack because of it, but the average person doesn't understand what it takes to look for a needle in a haystack. It's really easy from to judge these searches and these cases from our couches. And when you involve adverse environments and so forth, such as rivers, waters that are not nice, these are the Cumberland River right now is 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 not a place you want to be in. The temperatures, the current and the terrain that's on the bottom of that Cumberland River is is no joke. I've been there. Uh, I was there quite a few years ago when we pulled out 17 vehicles from there. So I, I know firsthand exactly how the Cumberland River is. Hats off to everybody who was out there on the river, really, really pounding it really hard to, to bring answers to that family. And that's what's important because this case didn't go cold. As humans, we're able to process death when we know, no matter how tragic it can be. You know, you, you can imagine the, the worst cases that you've ever been a part of with the FBI. When a family knows, they can process that and they can begin to move on. When a family doesn't know and they have no answers, it's brutal. I mean, that can't even really be put into words what that's like. And we're not meant to go through that as humans. So the, the important thing here is to thank God that the family has answers now. Any time you have a tragic situation like this, what can we learn from it? No matter what the situation is, what can we learn from it? How do we be better as searchers, as a community, and so forth? But my biggest thing is there has to be some accountability by local Broadway establishments to take better care of people when they leave establishments unable to care for themselves. That's not a knock on Luke Bryan. I love Luke Bryan. But this is this is a this is a learning experience. If we need to turn tragedy into triumph, we need to take Riley's case and help the future victims who are going to go missing from Broadway and New Orleans. They have a beautiful camera system set up in this abundantly huge tourist place to prevent crimes. But when crimes take place they can track down the answers. Had there been an amazing system like there is there and also overseas, this would have been narrowed down much quicker. I couldn't agree more with you, Doug. Not only about cameras, everything you said about the bar, and I think it would be amazing if they could just put in place, listen, as a bar, it is, and they need to make this a law. If you are going to remove somebody because they're so inebriated, you can't have them in your establishment, you need to pay that $5 Uber, which is about what it would have been uh, to have Riley go one mile to his hotel. And you put him in the Uber, and you make sure that he gets to where he uh, needs to be safe. And the other thing is, if that can't work out for you, call the police. I would much rather a kid be in the drunk tank in a jail overnight 
safe and alive with a public intoxication charge that could, you know, even be resolved with a few hundred dollars and be alive. That's what needs to happen. And then the other thing is fencing. It was amazing when I was seeing how easy it is to get into a 45 degree drop off going almost straight down. 80 degree, it looked like at some point straight into that Cumberland. What do you think about that? Rules are made for a reason, right? I think it's really easy for us to assess things and make improvements. And that's what really needs to be done. You know, like you said, why is there that easy of an access? Um, knowing you have a strip where it's common for the average person to be drunk, intoxicated. I've been down there. I go down there a lot. Like everybody down there is having a wonderful time, enjoying themselves. And you should not have that easy of an access to the river right there. It's a big learning. You know, there, there should be huge curved fences on the top of those walls. Right now, there's just, I, I believe, like waist high walls there. You know, whether you walk across the bridge or you walk down the waterfront right there opposite of the stadium, the Titan Stadium, you know, it's a steep drop. It is a very steep drop down into there. And obviously, Riley ended up there at this time we're having this conversation. There's still things that have to be done with the medical examiner and so forth. I'm really curious to hear what the medical examiner's findings is going to be. That's going to be really important in this. Right now, we don't know. They just found his body yesterday. By the time this comes out, I'm sure we will know. Does he have water in his lungs? Are there any other injuries to his body? There's multiple people that are missing in the Nashville region over the last five years. And you, you take an area like that. At, at this point, as an investigator from you know your background and from my background, I have to never count out what ha may or may not happen. Because the second you discount a conclusion on a case, you lose track of finding answers. Until you can definitively rule something out, nothing is ruled out. How did he end up in the water? I think it's a really, really important for the Nashville community, which is an amazing community, to learn from this and to make improvements and to learn with mistakes create rules, uh, failures create wisdom. And that, that's what needs to come from this scenario, no matter what happened. And definitely there needs to be some better safeguards from uh, those bars down there. And not only just those bars, but nationally, maybe we can take this situation and make it better. I've had people related to me that have, have experienced really horrible things after, you know, bar incidences and so forth. If an individual is going to patronize your establishment and become unable to defend themselves, take care of themselves, you are thereby responsible for anything that happens to them thereafter at least in the immediate few hours. With knowing that, this case is gonna set a precedent. And it, it's tragic for Luke Bryan and his bar because he's getting all the bad PR on it, but he's gonna be able to turn this around. He's gonna be able to take care of this family and he's gonna be able to set the standards in the nation for what it really means to take care of somebody uh, after they leave a bar, after they've been asked to leave because they can't take care of themselves. No, I agree with you, but from a legal standpoint, I don't know how much legally that Luke Bryan's bar is actually going to be culpable. And this is why, at least according to the law I was looking over, is that in Tennessee, you can only sue if you're a third party and suffered from that individual who left intoxicated. So as an example, if Riley would have gone out and just say he beat somebody senseless, then that person that he beat could sue, obviously, Riley and the bar. But Riley, on his own accord, cannot, nor can Riley's family. But I think to the bigger point is, will Luke Bryan, as you said, what a perfect opportunity for Luke Bryan to step up and say, listen, this is horrible. My bar is going to do X, Y, Z in the future when somebody, and, and like you said, let's set the national precedent. The other thing I wanted to talk about, Doug, and this is not to point fingers because I believe his fraternity brothers that were with him for the rest of their lives will hurt deeply. But I think another just reminder in social media, mainstream media at every point, buddy system, do not leave that friend alone. So true. You hit it. 
spot on. You go out as a group, you stay together as a group, you communicate as a group, and that's really important. And if you're going to go out in a group, you know, designate one person. And if you can't designate one person in this scenario, I get it. It's Nashville. Your whole group wants to go out and party, whether it's Uber or, or Lyft, taxi, you name it. You got to check those boxes to be responsible for yourself and the group you're with. Making sure the communication is there. Sometimes groups split up. Oh, we're at this bar. We're at that bar. We're leaving. Okay, you're leaving. Well, who's with you? Where's this person? Or where's that person? Account like tracking. Tracking is key in this situation with Luke. I, I don't know the exact circumstances that took place within the bar. I, I know local PD does. I've spoken to a local detective who says that they have been amazingly cooperative, mm -hmm. and there's by them there's no heat whatsoever. Uh, actually, what took place by them happens every night. In Riley's case, on a scale from one to ten, was a two. Uh, there was no violence involved. There, there was no, you know, exertion, you know, overexertion of, you know, defiance or anything like that. We'll see. We'll see what what's what's going to happen with this. And it's tragic, but it's a it's a success that we're talking about it and that we're having these conversations because that's what life's about is about growth and learning. No matter where you're at or what you're going through is. How do we learn from this? I agree, Doug. And, and then there's one more point on Riley Strain's case that I, I think is important. And, you know, I have kids this age, exactly this age. There is something that goes on. I don't know if you've heard of it, but they actually, the goal is to what they call drink to blackout. I've heard kids discuss it. Unfortunately, I've seen kids in that state multiple times and it's the goal. The goal is to drink to blackout. Now, when I was growing up, and I was a bit of a goody two-shoes, but when I did finally take my first drink, no one thought like that, that I was ever around. I mean, you might drink and people would get drunk, but nobody ever sat down and said, listen, I am going to consume as many beers through this bong as I possibly can, and my goal is blackout. A, have you heard about this also? And B, the reason we're seeing so many of these young men, and it's typically young men in water, Brendan Santo, Christian Martinez, I could name Brian Bone. This is just off the top of my head. And there's dozens more. Have you seen this? I've heard a lot about it. And it is popular among uh, younger, you know, 25 younger. And we're, we're mainly talking about, you know, fraternities and college groups and also high school students. It's popular. Kids nowadays are really extreme. Social media has raised the current generation. What I mean by that is a lot of parents, most parents don't have absolute influence over their children like previous generations. If your child has a smartphone, they have a tablet. If they have a PlayStation or Xbox, you do not have absolute influence over your child. Therefore, they're learning from an online AI community per se of what it is to be normal, how they judge their actions, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to act and so forth. And that's, that's a whole new animal of boundaries within this new generation. They're extreme. They're absolutely extreme. There's pros and cons to that. There's good things, you know, with the internet and smartphones and all the, you know, we live in a time that is one of the best times in the world. So it's really easy to point out the bad things. There's good things. So I don't want to seem like a negative Nelly, but there's contributing factors from a lot of different levels when you talk about, you know, how extreme kids are. And these are kids, you know, they're babies in the world. They haven't really experienced anything. They're still within their fraternity. You know, they're still learning social and environmental impacts and, and, and socialism in general. And it's dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. I, I feel like all the time we're, we're hearing new stories of extreme things that have taken the lives of children based upon the, the lack of real, real safe boundaries. Moving on a little bit from Riley, because I, I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen it in social media. But some people are, of course very upset that Riley Strain received so many resources, so many volunteers, uh, the Cajun Navy, and another little boy that is right in that area, Sebastian Rogers, 15 years old, who has autism, but went missing really around the same time. And now, thankfully, a lot of resources are diverting over to Sebastian. But his name, unfortunately, because of the timing, I think, of both Riley and Sebastian missing around the same time, 
uh, Sebastian got a lot less notice, significantly less notice. So my question for you is, and I'm going to digress just for a second. My last case that I was involved with it with the FBI was a six-year-old child with autism. He disappeared. We polygraphed. Of course, the number one thing is you interview who's around him. You polygraph everyone. And the mom failed the polygraph. We thought she failed the polygraph because she was involved with something terrible by happening to him. What it turned out was she failed the polygraph because she was lying about locking up her house. And he was a wanderer. Some people with autism are more wanderers than others. Sebastian is not a wanderer by all accounts. My point is he was found at a little pond just very close to his house, a private pond. Doug, are there maps? Are there easy ways to find little ponds? I know there's Google Maps, but is there something with more expertise than that? And what do you think in terms of searching those waterways? Because I can tell you in that case, when I first came on board as that incident commander, they said, listen, we've already served. The local said we already searched them. And I said, you know what? We're getting every dive team in this area and we're redoing it. And so that's why I'm always hesitant, even though right now there's some less than desirable statements being made by certainly the stepfather really painting himself in a bad light. But you can never jump on that because we've heard no evidence really pointing in their direction. What would you do? What will you do? Are you thinking about going out there? Enlighten us. You know, anytime somebody goes missing, thankfully, we get a lot of emails, tags, DMs, and so forth. And, you know, initially in active cases, you know, we have to let law enforcement do their thing and run their course before we can be involved unless they're requesting us. Typically when that runs its course, then we can come in based upon a lot of different variables and so forth. This particular case we involved with Sebastian, we were contacted right away by so many people. And that's amazing because that's how I've been able to help solve the cases that I've been able to help solve in the past. Sebastian's case is, is a unique one because Sebastian has, he's autistic and no autistic child is the same. So when you talk about somebody that's missing and developing a uh, victimology profile, lost person behavior profile, all the, the profiles that you know we use on our end, on the professional side to who is this person? How do we look for this person? How do we find the suspect and so forth? It's kind of hard. Every area is different. Every department has different resources. Every state has a different level of resources. Everybody that I have found are in areas that have been searched already. Everybody's capabilities are different. Every team has their own unique specialty in what they're used to. There's really no rhyme or reason to search and rescue other than a textbook, but the textbook only gets you but so far. Outside of that, you have to use the wisdom that you've obtained in the field. How much of that have you had? In a lot of different areas, the resources that are sent out in departments are in ancillary duties in these scenarios. They're not necessarily used to taking on these types of responsibilities. They're just assigned in these scenarios. Not a lot of experience when you're talking about really digging into a search area. In the Kylie Rodney case, we know we've there was a lot of mistakes made because there were so many agencies involved and the reporting back to commanders were inaccurate and so forth. And so things were overlooked, things fell through the hole and all of that. In Sebastian's case, he wandered off, obviously. You have a lot of the internet, which is amazing in these cases, and finding answers and also creating drama. And that's just a side effect of these cases online. The things that are tied to the stepfather and so forth and whatnot. You gotta understand these people aren't used to being in front of cameras. They're not used to answering these kind of questions. They're not influencers. They're not actors. They're not prepped for this. No one is prepped, especially a loved one, to lose their loved one. And when you put them in front of cameras, 90% of the time, things are going to seem off, which is why it really takes trained individuals, you know, like yourself and other law enforcement that are taking these you know, lie detectors and these interrogations to be able to set those things aside and judge, yeah, that's just the normal stuff we get from somebody who's not used to being in an interrogation room and not and is dealing with the most worst grief of their life, losing a loved one and not having answers. You feel like you're a suspect and law enforcement has to go through the motions. And when somebody goes missing, you know what? It is most likely somebody that's connected to that person. That's where law enforcement starts, 
their investigation. And then they have to move out. And it's a process of elimination there as well. So whoever was around Sebastian at the time is a suspect until ruled out. When you have a young child out there that's wandering around who is technically mentally handicapped, they're easily taken advantage of. And we have a lot of really bad, nasty people out there. It's a process of elimination on the suspect side, but also the search side. Where are the wooded areas? Where are the ravines? Where are the places that somebody could go and hide? Because autistic children, no matter where they're at on the spectrum, are known to kind of hide, to kind of panic within themselves because they're so hyper intelligent and they will absolutely disregard their safety and their health. But that's a really big factor when you're searching for someone, especially with autism, is where to look. Are they looking in those hard to look places? And are the people that are there, boots on the ground, looking in those hard places, really, really doing what it takes to really get in there? A lot of the law enforcement dive teams, they have risk matrices. Diving community is one that is drilled on absolute safety. I can tell you right now, if I would have listened to any of that stuff. You wouldn't find anybody. Sort of, yeah. A lot of the stuff that I do is so dangerous. A lot of dive community, they don't like me. I'm not a scuba diver. You know, I violate everything that's taught in those scuba schools. And, and that's what it kind of takes to produce answers, especially in a case like this, in Sebastian's case, where someone has gone missing for so long. Authorities, multiple agencies have run the course. You know, if you want to try to do something that hasn't been done by anybody else, you got to be willing to do something that hasn't been done. Well, I was going to mention right before we got on, Doug, uh, there was a hit by a canine and it's actually caught on film. It's already hit social media and uh, they called law enforcement. Law enforcement has told all volunteers to get out of that area. Apparently there's a mound. I, I'm just giving you facts. I saw the dog hit myself. There's a mound, if you will. We don't know what that means, though. They're very far away, actually, from where a Sebastian would be. But as you may know, the dogs did track Sebastian to a construction site where the scent ended. And at least in my experience, when that happens, it's often because there's a vehicle that then takes the person. And that's why the scent is lost. So I think it makes a lot of sense that they're looking at every place they can that could be accessed, uh, even though the distance is great, there's a reason for that. The other thing is, and I wanted to uh, point this out, that I do understand why the slews are all over this. I did a recent poll and it was astronomical how many people believe that the stepfather, the stepmother, or in combination are involved. And it didn't help when uh, Mr. Proudfoot got on social media and said he whipped Sebastian with a belt because, first of all, he's autistic. And you really aren't allowed by law to hit a special needs child. So I understand the concern, but I think we still have to go with the belief that he did leave. And the other thing is that's really concerning, Doug, is he was barefoot. How far can you go barefoot? And was he vulnerable, made it to that construction site, which was pretty close, and then picked up at that point and taken somewhere? That's one of the most suspicious things about Sebastian's case is that fact that he was barefoot and nobody saw anything. Jennifer, we're talking about winter in Tennessee. A barefoot child, somebody's going to notice. I don't have a law enforcement background. I've learned on every case that I've gone through. Uh, every case is different. Every search is different. And I try to take that wisdom through my successes and my failures, and my failures are far beyond my successes. I've learned to be careful with speculating too much in one direction. I've learned to to be really level-headed, never discount something, and never focus on just one angle. Although I'm not looking for suspects when I do what I do, I'm looking for the where, not the how or the why. Theorizing for me on the how and the why a lot of times leads me to the where they are. Keeping an even head and not ruling anything out just really improves the odds of finding somebody. I think it is important to note in this particular case that neither parent has lawyered up. Yeah. And I think that that typically for me as an investigator, you look at that right away. Are they willing to take a polygraph? No matter if people have their reservations about a polygraph or not, typically people who think that or know, I shouldn't say think, people who know that they're innocent want to take a polygraph. 
That's just the human behavior you will see. You, I've seen people where their attorneys are sitting there and say, you're not taking a polygraph. And they say, hell yes, I'm taking a polygraph. They believe in their innocence. And as an investigator, that's important. It's the same a little bit when it comes to lawyers. You know, does somebody lawyer up right away? And a lot of people will say, well, it's smart to lawyer up. Look at all the people pointing in their direction. But ultimately, if you believe in your own innocence and know you're innocent, you typically aren't going to go in either of those directions. I think what is concerning, Doug, is why in the world aren't these parents out there beating the pavement like the father is? right? The stepfather and the mom are not really beating the pavement. But, you know, when I saw the recording of the mom, to me, she looks like somebody absolutely emotionally strapped. Like she is so upset. That's what I'm seeing. I would say from watching their behaviors, their mannerisms, and the characteristics that they've displayed during a lot of the interviews, I, I didn't really see anything alarming. Obviously, some things that are said like I said earlier, when you take normal people from middle class, lower caste society, no matter where they're at on the economic scale, that aren't used to being in front of the camera or a microphone, they're going to say things that are going to, to be suspicious and they're going to come off awkward eventually, the more they're on camera. I've watched a lot of what they've done with social media influencers, the interviews and the news interviews. It's nothing alarming, nothing like okay, they're hiding something, they're suspicious, or that didn't add up, or they're lying based upon things that are known. And uh, law enforcement really uh, hasn't been too aggressive with them based on this case. So internally, whatever the local PD has gone through, they seem to be satisfied with the parents and the initial household. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. And certainly law enforcement is being very quiet. As they should. As they should. I mean, that's the bureau mantra. Normally the locals are much more chatty. The bureau never says a word even after the case is over. It is what's best for the case. Back to my question. I'm putting you on the spot. What are your thoughts about going out there? It is on my radar. Uh, now that the Cajun Navy is there, I am really, really interested in what's going to happen. I mean, I'm watching it very closely. I have some mapping in some areas that I've shared with locals. Things have been searched that I was interested in. Not to sound cocky or arrogant or anything. If I haven't searched it, it hasn't been searched when I am there. So if I were to come into the area today, nothing that's been done before me, I would ever take into account based upon all the cases that I've helped solve or in areas multiple agencies have already searched. But the Cajun Navy is unorthodox. They have some unique capabilities that they produce a lot of answers for families and law enforcement. So I'm keeping an eye on that. If not, I definitely will be there. My schedule definitely takes me there very soon and we're keeping an eye on it. That's so great to hear, Doug. That's what I, I was hoping to hear because I, I just have so much confidence in you and in your team because I know your work ethic. I know your capabilities. I've seen them myself. Doug, I hope that, you know, we've talked about work at a project in the future together. I'm really looking, looking forward to that. We'll keep that as a surprise, a little ace in our pocket. Let's keep in touch certainly on what's going to be happening with Sebastian. Doug, again, can you tell everyone where they can find you? You can find me, Doug Bishop. That's on Instagram, Facebook, you name it. It's just Doug Bishop. I'm with United Search Corps. You can look our website up at United Search Corps. Dot org. We're a nonprofit organization and we are 100% funded by the community for the community. And our mission is to find answers for families and advocate for families who have lost loved ones and victims who no longer have a voice. We really need all the help that we can get. So if you can, whether it's a dollar or two dollars, we have a donation link on our website, unitedsearchcourt.org. And that's what helps our wheels turn. That's what helps families get advocacy and answers and find hope. Thank you. Perfectly said, Doug. Uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, and again, I can't thank you for coming on. Thank you for your advocacy. Thanks for all you do. And mm -hmm. we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to everyone who joined in watching this episode of Break the Case. I think it is so important that we use our platforms always to keep missing children like Sebastian and like Riley was at the forefront 
of our platforms. It doesn't matter whether you have 10 followers or a thousand followers. What matters is that you do everything you can to get the names of these individuals out in the forefront because when it goes wild on social media, it goes wild on mainstream media and it causes reactions that are positive in terms of searching and looking for these kids and adults that are missing. Until next time, may justice be served. Thank you.